everyone, and welcome to the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine's Research Learning Series, or RLS. I am Dr. Gita Pensa. I'm from Brown University, and I am delighted to be moderating this session called A Tale of Three Researchers. We have three different emergency medicine physicians who do research, and they all happen to be fellowship trained in ultrasound, which was actually intentional for the session so we could focus on the differences in their research experience. Uh, and we wanna talk about lessons they've learned along the way in hopes to inspire our listeners who are early on in their EM research careers and hopefully provide some helpful pearls and pitfalls. And we're gonna start with some introductions and then we're gonna do rapid fire questions for each of our panelists, giving them just a few minutes to answer each of them. And I think that'll give everybody a lot of great information. So. Uh, let's start with Dr. Michael Gottlieb. Can you wave for us? All right, Dr. Michael Gottlieb is an associate professor at Rush University. He did both his residency and fellowship at Cook County and is currently the ultrasound division director and ultrasound fellowship director at Rush. He is also the chair elect of the ASEP ultrasound section and past chair of the AAEM ultrasound section. He's authored over 400 peer reviewed publications He's an editor for seven journals. He's received over $20 million in primary research funding. And he also recently received the AEUS grant from SAEM to study the accuracy and application of artificial intelligence to enhance beeline identification. Welcome, Dr. Gottlieb. Thanks for having me. Okay, now we have Dr. Francis Russell. Wanna wave for us? There we go. That's Dr. Russell. She's a tenured associate professor at Indiana University. She went to medical school at the University of Wisconsin, uh, residency at the University of Connecticut, and her fellowship in ultrasound at Cook County Hospital. A lot of Cook County people on our panel today. She previously <laughs> served as the ultrasound division chief and fellowship director, and Francis currently serves as the research director for the ultrasound division, the SAEM AEUS research officer, and the ASAF Ultrasound Research Subcommittee co-director. She has 25 clinical ultrasound publications, mainly in the areas of heart failure and education. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Lynn Rapolo. You have to wave too. <laughs> Dr. Rapolo is a professor in emergency medicine at University of Texas Southwestern. She was part of the residency leadership for over 15 years and stepped down to do the ultrasound fellowship. She never received the training for in residency. I can attest to this fact as I did residency with Dr. Rapolo many years ago. Uh, she has conducted almost 50 research studies in her 21 years of practice, most of which were most of which were with her medical students and her emergency medicine residents at Parkland Hospital. She's the director of resident scholarly activity and was recently promoted to senior editor for the Journal of Emergency Medicine. So welcome Dr. Rapolo. All right, so what I'd like to do is to ask some rapid fire questions now, um, and I'll call on you each as we go along. And so my first question for you is, when you were in medical school, did you do any research? And if so, why did you do it? And what did you do? Let's start with Dr. Rapolo. I actually, I did two research projects. Um, I did them because I just thought that it was something that, you know, you want to be um, more competitive and to learn more about the specialty that I wanted to do, um, emergency medicine, very early on. And I um, was able to find a couple of mentors. Peter Rosen was actually my mentor in medical school, and I did a research project with him on um, nasal tracheal intubation. That's how old I am. It was a retrospective chart <laughs> review. And then I ha had another mentor, Ellen Mazel, who's a CHF researcher, and I did uh, a study on troponins because troponins were a very new thing back then and, and um, they weren't published till after I graduated from medical school but um, things were much different then I we kind of I had a mentor and they met with me briefly they guided me a little bit and then they um, kind of like had me do almost everything and I'm only bringing that up is because times have changed I mean now when and now that I'm a mentor it seems like I had to have like a lot of things already prepared for medical students to do research with me, which is, I think, just, you know, a, a, just a sign of the times, but, um, but just different. But, um, but anyway, I'm glad I did it. It was a good experience. Excellent. How about Dr. Russell? Well, uh, Lynn, you sound really lucky that you had some great mentors that are kind of like leaders in the field. 
um, early on for emergency medicine while I was studying fruit flies and nematodes. Um, <laughs> so my experience in undergrad was really doing benchtop research. So I essentially just found a professor and started doing research with him. And then I did a summer research project um, out in Wisconsin studying uh, nematodes. Um, and really, both projects were a great experience and introduction into how to do research. Um, although obviously my clinical, my interests now are in, in clinical research, um, but it was still a good learning experience. Um, and essentially I did research because I also figured it was part of the application process would make me more competitive and also something I could potentially be interested in down the line. Excellent. Dr. Gottlieb, how about you? This is why I'm glad we're having a little bit of a pathways aspect because you all have such really cool tracks to go through there. I was the polar opposite. I went into med school. I'm like, I hate research. This seems really painful and boring. You're going to have to drag me kicking and screaming through it. And I didn't do any research through med school. I was definitely kind of a late bloomer starting to catch the research bug during residency. But I remember distinctly as I was making my rank list of residency programs, I had like this running kind of tabs. And one of the tabs was like, how stringent is their research requirement? And the ones that were more stringent, I was like, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> not interested. And I like downgraded them. Like I anchored them based on that, which, you know, in, in retrospect, I, I loved it once I started doing it, but I went through all of med school. I just, I think I just didn't know it yet. And so my vision of it externally really influenced what I thought I was, what I thought it was. And then when I started doing it, I was like, this is amazing. I really like it. Um, and I think I missed that opportunity to do it during med school and well, try to make up for it since. Uh, I would say you have. Um, so <laughs> what advice? I second that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to hear what advice uh, each of you would give to medical students who were interested in getting started in research. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, let's start with you. So I think kind of almost the opposite of what I did, which is be open to research. <laughs> Just be aware that there's, you know, different types of research. There's all different you know, fields and areas and what you may imagine research is, and this probably doesn't apply to just medical students, there's probably anyone listening to this, um, what you envision research is, isn't necessarily what it can be. And I think if we use a broader lens of scholarship, well, scholarship isn't, isn't always what we imagine this kind of minute field of it to be. So try out different things, put your feet in the water, figure out what things you like, try out different aspects of it. And particularly, you know, when you're new to a project, when you're new to research, look at this not with the lens of what can I walk away with in terms of like papers or the line on the CV, but look at this in terms of what you can learn, what you can add to your skill set, even if it's just to make you better able to dissect the literature, try to go into it with that mindset of like, what can I learn from that? And it will pay dividends no matter what comes out of it. Awesome. Okay. How about Dr. Russell? Yeah. So I would agree with uh, what Mike had just said. Um, I think having an open mind and really thinking about what you're interested in. Um, if you find something that you're interested in, you're going to be more likely to want to work on it and more likely to kind of delve in and see what's already been done in that field and, and really get involved. Um, I'd say don't be afraid to approach a faculty member. So say you're going into a specialty and you know there's a faculty member who's doing research. Um, even if they don't have time to do research with you or mentor you, they will probably know someone else, like a junior faculty member even, who has a project that you can become involved in. And just be willing to be open-minded, willing to be hardworking, and willing to try things on your own and understanding it's okay to fail. There's a lot of failure in research. Um, but knowing that that's a part of it and kind of picking yourself back up again and continuing to uh, try hard. Dr. Rapola, how about you? Well, I, I definitely agree with everything that has been said. I think that people hear about research and for some reason, it's just, it's just an intimidating word that people just like, you know, like Mike was saying, but I, I think just being open to it and if um, you're not going to fail, you know, with research, especially as a medical student, because you're going to have a mentor and you're going to be working with other people. And I think when you commit to wanting to do research, it's networking, network 
with as many people, get second opinions on, on whatever you decide to go into. Because you want to make sure you know, you're, you're going into a project that's meaningful for you and that you're going into it with a person that's going to really mentor you. Because there's just so many different kinds of people and it, you, know, you just want to find somebody who's a good fit. Um, the other thing is there are so many, I and mean, I apologize for my dog, um, but there, <laughs> there are so many opportunities to, for, for you to, to win here. Um, to learn about just what research is, for you to appreciate the science, for you to become a better doctor, for you to um, collaborate on a project with some pretty amazing people. And I, I think that's kind of one of the biggest attractions for me in research now is the collaboration. I, I usually do like a team approach with a medical student resident, other faculty, and I just really in, enjoy it. But I do see the medical students blossom. Um, I write lots of letters for residency. I think we see just a different perspective of them and I write great letters and I advocate for them. And so I just think as a medical student, there's so many, um, it's just a win-win-win um, in, in multiple ways if you are open to it. Not to mention you're gonna become an expert on something and you may be able to build upon it later on in, in, in your future. That's a great point. Okay, so let's move it into residency training. Uh, when you were in residency, did you do research and why did you do it and what did you do? So Dr. Russell, how about you? Um, so I did do research during residency and essentially I had a faculty member who was my mentor who I loved working with clinically and so I knew I had to do research to graduate, I had to do a scholarly project. So I was like, hey, do you have anything I could work on? Um, and so we ended up doing a project looking at disposition of psychiatric patients and kind of how good are we as emergency physicians kind of deciding the disposition of these patients. Um, and it was really my first uh, kind of time where I was dipping my toe into the clinical research arena. Um, and it was a really good experience. I ended up winning the Connecticut ASAP Oral Abstract Award for this project. Um, and the nice part about it, which I kind of look back now, is the longitudinal project. So it wasn't just one of these one-offs. There were other projects planned kind of in the future. Um, it had grant funding. I, had, I was involved with writing the manuscript and doing literature search and submitting it for publication. So I learned a lot along the way. I had a really good mentor. Um, so that kind of kept my interest. And although it wasn't my area of interest for research, it was still a great kind of uh, process for learning about research. Okay, Dr. Rapolo. I kind of got derailed <laughs> during residency. <laughs> I came from California. There's a lot of earthquakes. I matched in DC. I saw an opportunity to get very involved in disaster because it also wasn't a thing um, when I was a resident. So um, my scholarly project, I my husband says I could have done probably two, what am I saying, two, 10 <laughs> papers because I actually rewrote the entire hospital's disaster plan because it was this brewing binder with a bunch of like dusty papers and there was just a new way to do hospital disaster management. So that was one thing I did. And then I also wanted, um, I discovered and I had a mentor for the FEMA urban search and rescue team. And then, so every month I was just obsessed with training with them every single month for at least two or three years of my residency that they be they, um, I, I became an official medical team manager and was uh, one of the responders, um, one of two physicians who responded to the Pentagon um, as a medical team manager. And so my whole residency was really just disaster. And, and, um, and so anyway, there just wasn't any time for research. The residency was focused on disaster, but it was certainly not a disaster. Um, how about you, Dr. Gottlieb? I feel like I kind of fell into research. Um, I went into residency and I started to figure out what was my niece, um, mostly with a lens of teaching. And I realized I really liked airway. I like intubations. Like that was the thing I was really passionate about. So I wanted to learn more about that. Um, and I looked around, I looked left, I looked right. There's no attendings that do intubation research. No one does anything in the airway. And so I was like, oh, all right, now what? And so I asked around, and this is, I think, as a PGY-1 is the first year resident. So 
It wasn't like I had a broad network. My network was everyone I looked at and worked at shift set. That was the extent of it. So I, you know, one of my now long-term mentors and friends, I reached out to him and I, you know, I said, you know, Dr. Bailitz, uh, I'm looking to do airway research. Um, how can I do this? And he said, well, have you thought about ultrasound? And that was my first foray into ultrasound as well. And so we kind of combined those together. We came up with a study that uh, actually Dr. Russell was worked on the study with me as well. And this is my very first study looking at ultrasound for intubation. And that was kind of it lit the spark. I realized that the, the approach to it was fascinating. I loved that I had a question I could start to answer it. And then I had maybe a couple dozen more because I continued to study this and different ways of like taking this to the next level of saying, okay, well now what about this? What about that? And that, I think that ability just kind of approach it almost with this like childlike mentality. So I, I have a three-year-old and we watch tons of Sesame Street. And for those who've seen Sesame Street, there's this mantra that, that comes across every episode. It's like, I wonder what if let's try, right? They, like every time a problem comes up, they're like, I wonder what if let's try. My three-year-old like mimics it every time they do it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of feel as like as an adult, I'm like, yeah, this is basically what I do with my research studies. I'm like, I wonder if I could try this. What if, all right, let's just try it. And um, I think that ability to kind of approach curiosity and just go full fledged into it and kind of bring out your inner child has been really fun. Um, also, because my residents are brilliant and they're always coming with new things is like the challenge of keeping up to date with it and like different ways of just continuing to learn the literature and, you know, kind of double dip that to learn more about new stuff, but also to just understand the stuff that's there. So that for me kind of really just took a foothold and has been one of my driving forces, I think, ever since. I wonder what if let's try sounds like a really great theme for this whole thing. So let's talk about being a new faculty member. What was research like when you were striking out as a brand new faculty member? Um, and what advice do you have for faculty who might be interested in starting off the research career? Um, I didn't call on someone. How about uh, Dr. Rapolo? Um, that's a really good question, just because when I first started, we were kind of a skeleton faculty, and I really wish I had um, just a, a, a mentor. I know a lot of junior faculty, when they're, or when they were junior faculty, just kind of were able to, to find that one mentor that helped, you know, propel them into their career and and it was a little bit of a struggle and and I think one of the things is just you don't have to have just one mentor number one and another thing is just be careful just be cautious when you commit because I think one of the things I I did was I was so excited to get involved that I became a yes 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 person and there was just some projects which were probably not in my best interest and you know I had a, a faculty that wanted me to do all these things and he said that if you do x y and z which was like more than like just a ton of work. You could be second author, you know, just, and he was already a full professor. So I just, it just probably wasn't, you know, that's fine, but um, just find a mentor who really has your best interest in mind. And, um, you know, there's a lot of faculty and there's a lot of topics and things to choose from. And, you know, you, if you don't know your passion, um, you will discover your passion um, eventually, but you just have to really be open to it and look for it. Um, and also just, find opportunities where you can get a very strong foundation in research. You know, I know SAM has a program, the ARMS program. I know ASAP has the um, EMBERS program. Um, there's just a lot of um, just opportunities where you, because I mean, there's so much to learn. And I think if you develop a strong foundation, it's a building block and every opportunity experience and people you meet just become like, you know, add to your research experience in your career and make you um, just a stronger person and help you be more productive and, and less wasteful of your time and, and be on that track that you want to be on. Great. Dr. Gottlieb. So when I, I joined Rush uh, before we had a residency program, I came out of fellowship. I joined there and helped to build out an Ultrasound division, Ultrasound program. And there wasn't really much there because there was no existing residency. So we're trying to build this program out and I'm trying to develop as a young researcher. And I had this kind of like pause of well, where do I go? We don't have, like, you know, we're still mostly a clinical site. We're still growing and developing this. And we have everyone's focused on education at this time as we're building this program out. I think that was one of my first kind of key ins to, while it's important to have local mentorship, you really have to have a broader network. So I started to reach out to, to people that I'd known through my you know, chief, chief residency year. And then I started to reach out to people they knew. And you know, it's kind of almost like the, you know, someone, you know, someone, you know, someone, there's someone that'll connect you to the thing you're interested in doing. And so I ended up kind of finding people who were interested in the things I was interested in, which was, you know, at that stage of my career was some ultrasound, but also in faculty development. 
and trying to advance the, you know, the understanding of that arena. So I started to develop these studies looking at you know, fact development, multi-site type studies um, that I could not have done at Rush. There was just not the opportunities there, especially to do a solo site there, um, especially an unfunded solo site there with no <laughs> RAs and no residents. It, I, I think if I tried to continue to do it that format at that time, I would bang my head against the wall and I don't have a lot of padding. So that would have gotten old real quick. And so <laughs> as I'm trying to go across and figure out how to make this work, you know, I started finding people at other sites and then as the program built up, then we had enough internally to start supporting this. And now we have a lot more infrastructure, um, but I think it's kind of learning that aspect. And at the same time, while external mentors are really, really valuable, I can't emphasize enough. You need the local people as well, especially as you study here. You have, there's nuance. What works well at one site doesn't work well at another. And I think if you only use the external ones, you'll miss the opportunity to how to actually tailor it to your specific site. So I've since then kind of really emphasized having a balance of both external mentors and people who know that, but also internal mentors who know the institution and can guide us. And so I found that to be really helpful for my career. Making mistake. Uh, Dr. Russell, how about you? Um, so what they said, um, so kind of what Lynn was touching on, um, attend a course. Uh, I attended the Embers course through ASAP and that was a great experience. It was actually something I didn't really have to look into. It was built into my fellowship. And so me and my co-fellow and actually a couple other faculty went and it was a great networking experience. I'm still in touch with a lot of the other ultrasound faculty that were attending the Embers course. And so it's an excellent course to just learn about basic research and you actually write a very small grant while you're doing the course. Um, and that was the project I worked on during my fellowship year. Now, during a fellowship, you have a lot more time to kind of work on research. I think as a junior faculty, that becomes a little more challenging. Um, and there may be some ways around it. So having a discussion with your chair or with your vice chair of research of, hey, I'm interested in pursuing this research project. This is what I'm going to put into it and see if you can get some time to be able to work on the project that you're going to work on. Um, my experience is a little bit opposite of Mike in that I am at IU, there's a ton of resources, and then we had Jeff Klein here, who I essentially came to work with him. Um, he's an amazing mentor, and he's been doing research for so long. He knows all the nuances um, from regulatory to grant writing. And he's one of those mentors who really just wants you to pursue a project that you are interested in and is willing to support you in whatever way he can. And so I was so lucky when I started here, I not only had him as a mentor, but he set up an entire mentoring panel for me where I was studying cardiovascular ultrasound. And so because of that, I was able to get a lot done in my initial years. Um, I think you definitely need good mentorship, um, find a good mentor and try to soak in as much as you can from them. And again, be really hardworking and kind of as Lynn was alluding to earlier, I think as a junior faculty, you tend to get pulled into everything, anything and everything the department or the school could ask of you, they will. And so learning how to say no early and learning how to identify your niche and what what's important to you, and then saying yes to those projects that will relate to what you're doing. Because as we all know, you say, oh yeah, this will only take me a couple hours. And then it's like days later and you still haven't accomplished it. And so as if you can stay focused, um, you're going to be much more productive. Very good advice. Okay, so you've touched a little bit about on mentors, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about mentors that were important to you and specifically what characteristics about those mentors that made them excellent mentors or the opposite, if you wanna tell us anything about how not to be a mentor. Um, but uh, Dr. Russell, how about you start us off again? Uh, well, I think the success that I've had has been from my mentorship that I've received. So I was also with um, Dr. Baylitz at Cook County and he is a, a great mentor as well, um, as well as Karen Cosby. 
Um, and then when I came to IU, I was with um, Dr. Klein and then Dr. Pang. And so um, a, a strong mentor is someone who's willing to set time and listen and read what you have written. Um, they go through your grants, they go through your papers, they give you feedback that's helpful. Um, and it really needs to be someone that you as a mentee are willing to listen to, willing to get feedback from, and willing to try to improve yourself as a researcher. Okay, Dr. Gottlieb. I echo all of those points, and I would maybe make the, uh, the argument that we don't really need just one mentor. You know, as Dr. Russell was alluding to, she has Dr. Klein, Dr. Pang, and others um, Dr. Bayless, Dr. Cosby have gone through a, a line of them. And I like to think about as mentorship teams. I have multiple people across at any given time. And really, I try to cultivate teams that have different things I'm looking for. So some may be career mentors. They're the ones who will help me decide when I'm saying yes too often. They'll be the ones that can say, you know, is this really aligned with your directory? Sometimes it's a grant mentor. I need someone who will look over my grant and give me that targeted feedback. Sometimes it's a project mentor. Sometimes, you know, it's a different aspect of maybe work-life balance mentor, someone who's really good at you know, integrating or finding that sense of like what works for them and helping me get there. I think that's one aspect of it. I try to get a team and I try to utilize them for their skill set of what I'm looking for. Um, and I think, you know, two heads, three heads, four heads are better than one. So just getting sometimes just multiple opinions on the same thing is helpful too. Um, the other one is just getting a sense of what you're looking for, right? So if you look at those, there's a mentor, a sponsor, and a coach. And without belaboring them in lengthy definitions, big picture is I think a mentor is someone who's going to help kind of tell their experience and help guide me through that process. A coach is really trying to help grow me. And then a sponsor is someone who's going to help me, you know, to get there, but probably is going to spend a lot less time on mentoring. So I have people who I'm looking for is just mostly a sponsor role. If they mentor me, amazing. I would love that. But if they're really busy and they're willing to just help sponsor me up to that, that's okay too. And having that conversation to delineate what they're looking for has led to a much more fruitful relationship because then I understand, okay, you're primarily going to be in a sponsor role. And that's still very valuable to me. Versus asking me a mentor when they're not at the capacity to do so leads to something that we're both parties, I feel like, are just leave unhappy. Okay, Dr. Rapola. What they said. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and I have had many mentors. And I, I look at mentors as people that I want to have, have some kind of characteristic that I want to emulate and who know me and I know they have my best interests in mind. And they're just much more knowledgeable or skilled in some area that I could just go to them for advice. And sometimes they'll tell me something that I may not want to hear. Um, I had an idea that I brought up to my chair many years ago and she just sat me down. She goes, is this really worth the time that it's going to take away from your family? And, and, it, and it just, that question, it just made me think, I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, and I was just thankful for her that she helped me see the forest from the trees and just, um, you know, just those, those people that out there that really look out for you and just give you simple things like they telling me like, how long do you think this is going to take you? And then I tell them and they'd say, okay, well, multiply it by three. Is it worth it? You know, or, <laughs> um, or, or maybe I would have an idea and they would kind of change it around and say, Hey, you know, if you do it this way, this is all you're going to get out of it. But if you do it this way, you can create a lecture, you can be, a, you know, a leader in this, committee and just, you know, whatever, but they just, you know, help you to get the most out of your effort because, which are sometimes I, it just isn't, you know, as obvious to me. So, um, you know, and, and it's not one person can ever do that for you. And so, I don't know, I think we, we all have our, our mentors and the people that, that are going to help us in those different dimensions and thank God for those people. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's, let's turn the tables a little bit. Um, if you yourself serve as a mentor for students or residents or junior faculty, um, tell us about what has, what you've found to be most helpful to you as a mentor and what makes for a great research mentee. We both, you know, we all know that this is a two-way street. Um, and so the mentee has as important a role as the mentor does. So, um, what advice do you have in that regard, um, Dr. Gottlieb? So I think the key to any good relationship is how you started off. It's how you're going to establish the goals, the expectations. Again, 
what are you looking for? And as a mentee, what do you, what's your goal? What are you looking for as a mentor? What type of, you know, mentor mentee relationship have you, are you looking for what works well for you? Things like what's the cadence? Do you want to meet weekly, monthly, every six months? If you know that in advance, then I'm not surprised if I don't hear from a mentee for six months. If I'm expecting to meet with them every, you know, six months and they're looking to meet every week, that's going to be a disconnect. And we should probably discuss how we can remedy that early on. And even just how you meet. Sometimes with some of my, ment with some of my uh, mentors, I will actually text them or message them in Slack. And we just have a different way of like, I'll very rarely hop on a Zoom and that's okay because we can have really good conversations that way. So it's finding out what's the cadence, what's the medium for how you're going to meet with people. Um, as a mentee, I think what, and really actually as a mentee and mentor, it's being reliable and following through. As a mentee, I think coming prepared to the meeting, saying uh, with understanding of what you're hoping to gain out of it. As a mentor, you have to come prepared with an idea of what you're hoping to you know, provide and doing the, the work behind the scenes and being available and being there for them. And I will say one of my personal lessons learned that I've really strived to work on is it's really easy for us as human beings to find the flaw. We can say this is, and it comes from a good place, right? We want to help the mentee succeed. Here's, here's the limitations to your study. And I think if we end it like that, here's the limitations to your study. As the mentee, you put a lot of time and effort and a part of your soul is in this study to have it shot down with nothing after this. That's, that's demoralizing, it's debilitating. I, I would not want to do another study or at least with them again. Right. And I think if you're going to do this, I think you have to prime it and say, here are the areas I'm going to highlight and have some, you know, clear. And I always prefer praise over negatives. So you can also make sure you're making conscious efforts to highlight the really good things they've done and not just the negatives. And if a study's not feasible, I usually say, well, it won't work, but here's some ideas of how you can do it. And I do ideas as a plural thing because I don't want to take over their project. It's very easy for us to also take over and do it the way we want it. Here's some ideas. You brainstorm, we'll come back together. I'll guide you, but I'm not going to replace you in this project lead because I think it takes away the time that mentees so desperately need and that we all as human beings need, right? Um, so I think those are some of the, my lessons learned that I've really tried to be a lot more conscious of um, based on my own mentorship errors over time. I think that's great advice. How about Dr. Russell? Um, well, I think mentorship is so important as we've already talked pretty much most of this talk has been about mentorship. Um, and so with that, I've mentored over 20 medical students, residents, fellows, junior faculty um, in, in ultrasound research projects. And I essentially learned from my mistakes in, in the beginning. When I first started mentoring, I really had no idea what I was doing. I really, really wasn't given any advice on how to mentor. Um, obviously, I'd been a mentee in a mentee-mentor relationship, but I had never really been a mentor. So when I was first starting, I made a lot of mistakes. And I think one of the biggest was I was just working on projects with mentees, but really had no timeline, um, had goals in terms of what we knew the project would be. But one of my projects took about five years from start to finish. And we probably collected all the data in the first year. So the last four years was really just writing the paper. And that kind of really got away from me um, because we really just never set goals. And I kept being like, hey, when is this gonna be done? And it was just, it just was never happening. And so now when I have a new mentee, um, I want them to be invested in the project as much as I am, or probably more so than I am. And so we will set a timeline and we will set goals. And if those aren't being met, um, then it's when we have kind of a conversation about where the project is going. Um, so a good mentee to me is someone who is meeting deadlines. And they also come to a meeting with an agenda, knowing specific questions they may have about their project um, where I can help them in areas that maybe someone else can't help them with. Fantastic. Dr. Rapolo, how about you? Well, this is good timing only to be, because I recently had an experience where I had to take several weeks off right when I just had two brand new medical students to do research with me. I mean, we had a few weeks together, so we kind of connected and bonded. And um, and I I felt bad that I wasn't there physically, but I was there connecting with them 
at all times of you know the day and just like odd hours and like texting them and and just having these like Zoom calls and and toward the end when we actually just recently met and I I was apologizing to them because I felt like I wasn't at there as much as I, I I usually am and and I was really shocked when one of them said you have been the best mentor and I was like what <laughs> and so and I was just asking him them, you know, we were talking, having a conversation. And, and one of the things I just think that um, I've learned over the years, one of the, first of all, it is very humbling in this day and age to be a mentor because these students are absolute rock stars. And it's just such a privilege to work with them that I, I have so much respect for them and appreciation for them from the get-go. And I agree with everything that we've already talked about, but I, I think that they it resonates with them. And I think, you know, just because they're like first year second, and second year medical students or, or interns, you know, as part of the residency. And um, just over the years, I think when I, I've treated them more and more and more, you know, like this, and we work together as a team. Um, and then I just, I let them fly with their ideas and let them grow instead of like dictating what they need to do. And, and I'm always amazed at how um, they rise to the occasion and they, they always exceed my expectations, almost always. Um, of course, with some exceptions, you know. So, um, as far as like my expectation of them, just um, and it, they seem to have that naturally because I think that's how, like, in this day and age, to get into medical school and be where they are today is just having a good work ethic, be the best version of yourself, and strive to exceed expectations. Even you know, though you may not exceed expectations, it's frequently they do if they kind of have that goal in mind kind of thing. And, and I'm, I've just been very impressed over the last like five years of the quality of every single student I've had. I have not had one student where I felt like, oh, you know, why, why did I recruit them? Not that I've ever had actually many of those, but every once in a while, you, you know, unfortunately that happens. But, um, but anyway, that, that's my two cents. Okay. We got everyone on that one, right? I think so. Okay. Um, so if you uh, had advice to give to someone who, a new researcher who is just starting a research project, what nuggets of advice would you give them that might save them a lot of aggravation down the line? Uh, Dr. Rapol, let's start with you again. So I think all of us here can like write a book on the things to like not do <laughs> and the projects that were wasted. I had a project that I was kind of proud of, and my feedback from the reviewer was, why don't you do the study all over again? <laughs> and, you know, and anyway, those kind of things. And, and so I think now is um, for any new study, like, do your homework. I think like most of what you do with research and when you finally get to the data collection phase, your paper should kind of om almost be already written because you've reviewed the literature, or you've like, kind of gone through all of this, you can, you know, if you have the introduction, you know your methodology, you did a little pilot and you have it all kind of figured out. And then you've done so much review of the literature and you're familiar with everything that you can write the discussion. And so your actual data collection is just filling in the blanks. And that takes so much planning, 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 planning. Um, and, you know, there's so many unpredictables in research. I just had one that I, I didn't do a thorough enough pilot and there were some limitations and COVID happened, which was unfortunate. But, you know, it, if you plan ahead and you get a statistician involved, always and get a statistician involved early, don't bring up all this data and actually have them you know, figure this out and it's a mess and they can't really make any sense of it. Um, and, and it's, you know, you're basically data dredging or whatever. I mean, it, that's just like, to prevent all that from happening, planning, 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 orchestrate your team, um, and just get the right people involved. People that, that that could help kind of put the pieces together. And one of them, I'm just gonna say it again, is getting a statistician involved. And, and doing that ahead of time as always, I think now um, has saved a lot of the headache down the road. That's great advice. Dr. Gottlieb. I, I can echo that enough. I think that the pre-stage is so important. So I'm going to speak to a different area, and that's the writing. I think there's a lot of areas where we can be a lot more efficient with what we're doing. Um, speaking to you know, to Dr. Russell's example, that like that paper was one year for the paper, but five years to write it out. I have absolutely been there as well. And one of the things I've learned is that you can write a paper before the study's done. 
you can write the entire paper before it's done. And it's actually way more efficient for a few, a few what we'll call economies of scale. And it's, in essence, there's a couple of pieces of it. One is when you're at the start of the project, you've done this lit search. So all the literature is fresh in your mind. It is probably never more fresh in your mind because you've just been diving it, assuming you did the pre-work for it. Like, you know, this literature. So that's the whole background and probably the majority of the discussion, because you have an idea what you think you're going to find. That's your hypothesis. It may change, but you have a pretty good presumption of that. You have your methods. That's what you're going to put to your IRB anyways. And if you actually force yourself to write it out, it's where you start to catch those things that are the, oh, I didn't think about this factor or that factor because I didn't have it thoroughly on paper. But when you actually force yourself to write it out as if it's a paper, you realize some of those gaps you had. And I'll do the results. I'll do the tables. And that's where I've more times than I care to recall, I've set up a study ready to run. I look at the table and realize that my data instrument was missing something I wanted. But it wasn't until I built my results table that I realized that wasn't on my instrument. And so by writing out there, it forces me to make sure I capture all the data that I want to do. It gives me a dry run of what my paper might actually look like. Um, it's fresh in my mind, so I'm actually not having to do a lit search twice. And the other aspect of it is when you think about that first project you did, everyone on the team is so excited, right? Everyone is really excited about this project. And everyone wants to do something and there's nothing for everyone to do because you're like, I'm going to submit to the IRB and I'll talk to y'all in two months. And you have this downtime where everyone has the maximal excitement and nothing to do. And I think that's a wasted opportunity. I think it's a prime time to engage people in actually writing the paper because they have nothing else they can be doing. And they're actually really excited about the project. No one's excited about the project at the end. Everyone just wants to be published at that point. Everyone's tired and, and wants to do the next project because you already have the results. You answered your question. Now it's just like, okay, now I have to do this. And that's where it'll sit forever in this kind of like queue of things you don't want to do. But if you do in the front, everyone's maximally excited. I think that it tends to be a lot more fun project. And then I just fill in the gaps when the data's back, double check my, you know, my most recent let's search, update my discussion. The paper is very easy at that stage. And it's a smooth process. And everyone's thinking about that next step. And I think that's the last thing is when you have a project, you should try to avoid any one-offs. If you're doing a project, figure out what the next step is be. It may be that your, your project is now going to be a lecture or a podcast or a blog post or the next study, but what are you going to do with this so you didn't put all that effort into it and your team didn't put all that effort into it for one single thing? Because I think that does all of us a little bit of a disservice and we should figure out how we can really maximize that to build our research trajectory instead of one-offs. Fantastic. Dr. Russell. Um, so I always start a project with a study development worksheet, and that kind of goes through what is my question, what is the population I'm kind of looking at, what am I going to do for my intervention and compare it to. Um, I go through my literature search and kind of within the study development sheet, it has like, what were the methods, what were the limitations, and kind of going through the limitations helps me to design my study so I address those limitations and kind of move forward in the field. Um, I go through kind of my methodology. How am I, how am I going to enroll patients? That's always like the big issue. Um, how am I going to get providers excited about the study? And then who's on your team? Like, who are you doing the research with? What are their responsibilities? What is your order of authors? And is that going to change if people aren't meeting deadlines? I'm very kind of set on deadlines and timelines because I feel like that really pushes projects along. And that's actually my current job now within my division as the ultrasound research director is to keep everyone on a timeline so our projects can keep moving forward. And so I always develop a timeline next. So what do I need to do? Who's doing the IRB and when is that going to be completed? And this is kind of my goal of when that should be done. Um, who's doing the data collection uh, tool that we're going to be using? And did you meet with a statistician to make sure that the way we're collecting the data is appropriate and the analysis we're going to do? And what is our sample size calculation if you're doing a study that's going to require a specific sample size? I think meeting with a librarian is also incredibly important, especially for me. I may not be the best person at doing a literature search, but luckily I have some friendly librarians that I can message and say, hey, this is the project I'm interested in. Can you help me do a literature search? And I do agree with what everyone else has said, kind of right early as much as possible. 
Um, and I think if you're applying for a grant as well, it's the same sort of thing. You have it down on paper. You've gone through what your project is. You can figure out if it makes sense, if it's something that's going to be feasible. You thought about the alternatives. Um, and I think having that down on paper really helps you to kind of figure out exactly what you're going to do for the study. And then don't be afraid to ask for help or ask for advice. Um, and it doesn't even have to be your mentor. It could be someone who like your vice chair of research or someone else in your department who's doing research who may be able to kind of help you, especially if you get stuck in areas. That's great advice. I just okay. wanted to mention something just some you made me yeah. think about just having like a research committee, um, our like ultrasound national group. Thank you to these two other two people who are with me, but, but they have um there's an ultrasound journal club, and at the end, there's a opportunity to present your current research idea in front mm -hmm. of a bunch of other people that are doing you know, similar research. And I have had just lots of just very helpful feedback. Um, and then we have kind of something similar within our own department every month they meet and we, you know, I encourage the residents to go and, and or, you know, our faculty to go and present their research idea, just a synopsis, just to get ideas and, and to, you know, bounce their methodology by them, because I just think there's always just different perspectives that you didn't think about. And, you know, I agree with everything they said, just, you know, just, there's a lot of opportunities to help you, you know, make your research great and make, help you to be successful if you, if you think about them. Yeah, and as Lynn was saying, it's nice to get a perspective outside of ultrasound because you may be seeing everything through your lens of ultrasound and it makes sense to you and it makes sense to other people who do ultrasound, but then the reviewers like this makes no sense when you go to actually submit your paper. So knowing that up front can kind of help you plan ahead. That's great. I'm going to combine a couple of questions that I have for you, and I want to ask you about the research that you do, the kind of research you do, and what you enjoy researching the most, and are you a funded researcher, and do you have any advice about funding for prospective researchers? So, Dr. Rapolo, let's start with you. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> I guess. Okay. What do you do? Yeah. Are okay. you funded? So so what I do, actually, I mean, I'm not, um, I mostly work, I work 11 shifts um, a month clinically, and I help to do, um, I'm, I'm an ultrasound faculty, so that's kind of another hat, and then I am um, help the residents with their scholarly activity, and that's kind of another hat, but then my, and then my research, and I really like to orchestrate teams of residents, medical students, and faculty, and it, now we have, I used to do the summer research program where we would I don't know, I would recruit about on the average of five, maybe seven. One year it was 13 medical students and would um, kind of come up with a bunch of random studies. And, and my thing I, I, I like to do is probably what most researchers would just like completely discourage. And that's doing completely different areas of research. And, and my passions come up you know, clinically with just ideas that we have and questions that we have that aren't answered. And, and so, and I've always been like that. Maybe it's my ADHD and that's probably why I'm not a big funded researcher like the two of them, because you have to continue to build in order to get that kind of level of funding. But, um, but anyway, but that's what I like to do. And I'm, you know, now I'm, I'm the senior um, author. Usually I help to orchestrate several research projects and I find one of the junior faculty who's interested and who needs to be promoted, who probably doesn't have as much experience in research. And then, so we kind of put together these teams. The medical students that I have are usually cross-trained in these multiple studies. And there's not a lot, um, I mean, usually maybe two or three going on at the same time, but I cross-train them. Each of the medical students knows ahead of time that they're primarily long-term going to be um, if you will, assigned, you know, for the abstract and the manuscript to this one study, but they're going to be cross-trained on all the other studies so that in the emergency department, they could be identifying, recruiting, consenting, collecting data on three different studies just because of the unpredictable nature of the emergency department. So that's a, that's kind of like where research fits into my life. And and I did one, um, I, when I first started, I got a big grant from the American Heart Association. I did a randomized trial and I was doing some CPR research. And then it just, I kind of fell into 
this little niche that's kind of unique to what I like. So, um, you know, I did consider writing a grant and, and then I just thought, you know what, this is like my passion is all these other random things that I do. So what else did you ask me? <laughs> I wanted oh, okay. to know what kind of research you did and whether or not you had funding. Oh, okay. Okay. So I, I, um, no, I don't have funding. I have like little funding. They're like completely like smaller projects because what happens is, is my initial goal really was to, um, increase the scholarly productivity of the residency. And, and I was part of the residency leadership for 15 years. And we just, there was just like, no, I'd go to these conferences and there were like no presentations or abstracts or anything for my residents. And so um, that just became something I was determined to do. And I did it for a number of years. Um, and so they're not fundable because they're just, you know, there are a few months here and the medical students were only available for a certain period of time. And that's who the people were that mainly collected our data. Um, so, I, I, like I said, I started off as being a funded researcher and I just kind of fell into this thing that I'm doing right now. And I, it's sustaining me. I don't know. I just, it got me to, mm -hmm. got me promoted. So it must not be that bad of a deal. Awesome. All right, Dr. Gottlieb, how about you? What kind of research do you like to do? Are you funded? Um, any advice about funding? I primarily sit between like four areas and I think this stems from what are my clinical interests. So I like ultrasound, airway, of course, um, MSK, and specifically within the context of like reductions and joint infections, and then medical education. And so these are all in themselves whole research tracks. And what I've tried to do over time is find ways that I can meld them together. There's sometimes I'm just really interested in one pathway, and that's totally, and that's been totally fine to me as well. There's some things I'll do, they're just isolated, you know, MSK work or just isolate ultrasound. Whenever possible, I try to marry them together into things like ultrasound for airway, which I've done maybe, you know, a couple dozen studies on it now that allow me to like combine two things I'm really passionate about and connect them together and it creates a little bit of a research picture there. On the other end though, I also give myself a little bit of the freedom to say, if I like something, I want to do something, I'm just going to do it. You know, as Dr. Rapolo was saying, there's things that she wants to do. There are side studies that have zero linkage to anything I do but they're interesting to me and I really want to study them. So I just do them. And I, I think that makes me happier, that freedom to just do the things I want to do while keeping a couple of clear, like foci of things that, that's kind of my main trajectory of it. And I found for me that similarly, it just makes it more enjoyable that if I have a question, I can just answer it. I don't have to worry about it being something, oh, it's not my, not my, it's not my lane. So I'm not going to do it. I like the ability to kind of step away and kind of try different pathways and get off the highway for a little bit and then come back onto it. And that's okay for me. Um, with regards to funding, so as of, uh, I guess, a couple months ago, I, I crossed $20 million in funding, um, mixes of foundation grants and governmental. Um, I think what I've kind of learned from that process is, again, mentors and sponsors are incredible here. Um, that I think is probably one of the biggest factors in there. I think from all the grants I've submitted to, my rejection rate is way disproportionate to the number of grants I've gotten. It's, it's even more than we, with papers. And I think that's okay. We learned from that. My first grant I wrote was embarrassing. I looked back and I, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no mentorship. I put something together and it, it got funded. And I still don't understand why, because I looked at this and I was, and the, even the aims weren't totally clear. I think it must've been a year where they were just bored and they said, oh, I'll give this guy a chance. But it was like, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. And over time I'm getting better and I'm still learning. And I continue to still learn. I expect that, you know, I will look back at my, you know, proposals now five, 10 years down the line and say, wow, I can't believe I even funded that because I think we learn from the process. So part of it is accepting that we're going to, we're going to have grants that are going to get scored really highly, which is poor in grant form. Um, we're going to have grants that, you know, are just going to get, you know, the equivalence of desks rejected. And that's okay. We learn from that, get feedback, figure out how we can iterate and improve forward. And I'll say my last piece of advice for grant writing is start early. However much time you think you need to follow from Dr. Bolo, multiply by three. And give yourself that buffer because it's going to take time to assemble your team. You want a team that's going to augment each other. I don't want three of me. I want people who are going to augment and bring skill sets that I don't have. And then we're going to work together. And that's going to, not only for me to have a really strong team, but it's going to pitch my grant. And here's how we complement each other. Not just here's three random people that all like ultrasound. Build time so, your so you have people that can externally review it. I like people to look at it before I'm going to submit and give me the external review to, you know, to Dr. Russell's point of someone's outside ultrasound, if I'm applying for ultrasound funding to say, yeah, this is interesting to you, but no one else cares about this. So tell me why I should care. And I might re repitch my entire paper into why people will care. 
You need time for institutional aspects of it. You need time for your chair to look at it or your vice chair of research, whoever's looking at this actually has to look at this and give you that feedback and make sure they approve it. I think with all that done, I also like to, as much as possible, avoid my internal procrastination and try to actually be at the front of the line because most grants agencies will look at them in the order they're received. So if you're the last one at the end, well, then you have to follow a lot of other really big applications. If I'm at the front, I haven't yet had to follow those other bigger applications. So I probably look a little bit better than at the end when I'm the very last one, if they've looked at a ton of them. So I think there's maybe a small advantage to that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Russell, how about you? What kind of research do you like to do? Are you funded? And any words of advice about funding? Yeah, so my uh, niche is kind of in cardiovascular ultrasound. So when I first started as faculty, I was looking more at kind of pulmonary hypertension and the right heart. And in fellowship, I looked at heart failure. And then now I'm back to the left heart um, looking at heart failure again. So, um, I've tried to stay as focused as possible kind of within that niche. Um, I think it's easy to be kind of distracted and involved in other studies. And I kind of fell into that mainly because I was approached by mentees wanting to do a project. Um, and I was like, sure, let's do it. And then I'd find that the mentee would graduate and I was stuck finishing the study essentially on my own. Somehow they didn't have email access anymore and stopped responding. So that happened on many projects um, and things that you think won't take very long end up taking a ton of time and kind of distract you. Um, so I'm excited. I'm now working on a project that I've actually wanted to work on for about six years now. And I finally have a good team in place. Um, and so I'm really excited about that project. I have some internal funding and I'm waiting to hear from a foundation grant. Um, I have just under $1 million in funding so far. Um, and that's pretty much been between institutional and federal funding. I think it's helpful to kind of attach yourself to someone who is a successful grant writer and successful at getting grant funding because you can learn a lot from them. Um, as Mike was saying, his first grant was not great. Mine was horrible. Like I literally wrote one page and thought that was a grant um, and it was not funded unsurprisingly. And so um, again, I feel like I, didn't necessarily take advantage of the mentorship that I had when I was applying for that grant. Granted, it was a small grant, um, but I really had no idea what I was doing. So I think um, going to these research courses, they also have grant writing courses. Just take advantage of that. Learn like what are the important parts of a grant? Where should you focus your time? And it's going to take three to six months to write a grant. You can't just sit down and get it done in a week. So understanding that, knowing like your grant's gonna be more successful if you have pilot data and you've shown that your study is feasible um, and you've thought about issues and you have a really good team who's going to help you get the grant done. And so I think um, getting funding is, I've always been kind of taught from my mentors is, is important um, because you know research takes a lot of time. So I work quite a bit clinically um, and my time at this point for research is essentially paid through grant funding. And so if I don't have funding, I'm doing it in my free time, which has definitely happened for many years. Um, but it's something that I'm passionate about something I find interesting. And really I see research as a way to impact patient care on a global scale. And so there's a lot of reward when it comes to doing research. That's great. And I'm gonna come back to that um, academic clinical balance. Um, we're coming up on the hour. So um, I have just have two questions left to get through. So if we could just get um, your answers to these two. I'd like to know how your academic and your clinical time is split. Can you talk a little bit about that balance? Um, Dr. Russell, you were just alluding to that. Could you give us a little more about that? 
Yeah, so my responsibilities outside of kind of my clinical patient care um, responsibilities, which are, make up about 60 to 70% of my time, I have some time to do administrative responsibilities through the ultrasound division. And a lot of that is, is just running the research aspect of it. So I'm kind of lucky in that regard because that's what I want to do. Um, and then about a quarter of my time is doing research. Um, and so um, obviously different times of the year, different months, depending on grant funding and what projects you have going on, I may work more, I may do research more. Um, and so it kind of really depends. Um, I think having that balance is great. That's one of the things I love about academics is you can kind of pursue your interests and your day to day is completely different and maybe totally different from your colleague. And so I love having that aspect of research incorporated into kind of my day to day activities. Great. Dr. Rapolo, how about you? I'm so glad you said that, Francis, because it, it is having just another opportunity to do something different related to what you do that balances your career. When I walk into the ER, it's fun. I don't know. I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I, I really enjoy seeing patients, and I really enjoy working with residents. And um, I don't do as much research as they do, probably more like 10% of my time. A lot of my time is clinically. And I, after all this time, because I didn't work as much when I was part of the residency leadership, um, I just realized like, I like to teach at the bedside. I, and so um, with ultrasound, it has given me an opportunity to have the special niche that I didn't have before um, and on, a lot more opportunities to teach. The research is kind of this overlying thing that I also do. And it just depends on what time of um, year or you know what I'm doing, I might be busier than other times, but um, but I do love it. I think it it definitely keeps it alive, um, and it's always like different. You know, every year I'm doing a different project. But by the way, I have focused now. I'm I'm doing only ultrasound research, and you know I actually have an agitation hat, and I do a little bit of on that, but it's mainly ultrasound. You're always keeping it fresh. That's great. <laughs> Even in my old age. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dr. Gottlieb. So I think I, what I've realized is I need that mix. So I, I still like the distribution of a mix of clinical admin, teaching, and research. And I don't think any of them can fully dominate. Now, if I'm at a grant or two and it's buying my time, then I may be doing more research at that given time. Um, but in general, I kind of want to make sure I'm still all doing all of those. And so I've kind of built that into there where I'm still, you know, working clinic, I'm still teaching, I'm still running our, our division or whatever admin role will be in, in the future. And I, I still do research and I still even split my research time down, depending again, the grants, roughly 50, 50, or maybe one third, two third into funded versus unfunded. And the unfunded is you often, you know, my other passion projects, the things I'm, re I'm really excited about that will never get funded, but matter to me. And that's important to me too. And I've accepted that that will be unfunded time but it's worth it because I care about it. And I usually get a team of people who all kind of care about it too. So for me, totally worth it, even if unfunded. Okay, here's my last question for each of you. Uh, if you had to do it all over again, uh, would you do anything differently in regards to research? Dr. Gottlieb, let's start again with you this time. So I will say that while I definitely fell forward and made tons of errors and like have learned a ton through that process of it, um, I think there's a lot of value in that. I always approach it with a growth mindset that I try to dissect out and see what I've learned from the process. So I, I appreciate those aspects of it. Had I gone back in time, I think I would have sought more mentorship early. I think I didn't appreciate the value of that until I had it. And so I went through a lot of med school with not really much of a mentor at all and residency with a relatively small you know, number of mentors until I was a junior faculty. And that's when I started to really develop mentorship teams. And had I known now, I would have gone back and sought out more mentorship and different types of mentors much earlier in there. Um, it may have saved me some, make, make some errors, but at the very least, it would just help me to grow probably faster and in different ways that I'm seeing, appreciating a lot more now as faculty. Excellent. Dr. Rapolo? 
I was trying to think about this. I think I, I would have tried to focus earlier on just because I, I like how my like my brain is a lot more focused now. I feel like I'm less schizophrenic. But um, I think if I knew that this is what I was going to be doing, because I, I think there's so much to know, and I wish I always had a stronger just background in understanding statistics, as crazy as that sounds. And I think just having that background would help me with all these projects and um, just even reviewing literature for just keep things I'm interested in or as an editor, um, just it's something that there's just no way my husband would shoot me if I wanted to, to pursue an additional education because he knows I, I love learning, but not like that much. <laughs> but, you know, but if I was like a young, like I admire those students that are, you know, decide to get their MPH during medical school or during residency or do some kind of, you know, intensive statistical course or something like that. I don't know. I just think that having that background would make some of the things, the projects I've done a lot easier. Um, I mean, I would, you know, wouldn't do it now, but I just admire people that do or have, have that background and you can just see them discussing or, you know, just the conversations I have with them. They just have an understanding that I know I will never be as comfortable with that with, with it as they are, but I admire it. I totally get that. Uh, Dr. Russell, you have the last word. <laughs> Great. Um, I would say figure out what you're interested in. Find a mentor early, and it could be someone at your institution or someone else, even across the globe now with Zoom and other platforms, I feel like. Um, networking and working with someone outside of your institution can be so much easier. Um, understand there's a lot of failure in research and that's okay. Um, as Mike was saying, that's a chance for you to grow and to become a better researcher. Um, and I really do think that research is going to be easier if you are at an institution where it is valued, where maybe there's already a pathway um, I know right before I came to IU, Jeff Klein came the year before me, and he basically kind of restructured everything. So there are research meetings where you can go and present your project. There's research associates. There are R01 funded researchers. And so having the resources and the infrastructure at the institution you're at um, can make it a lot easier to be successful because you have all those tools available. Um, obviously difficult for faculty if you're not wanting to change the institution you're at, but maybe more so for fellows or, or residents or students kind of looking into the future at where they, they want to go and what kind of research they want to pursue and what resources are available. Well, fantastic. We are definitely out of time. So I want to thank our panelists so much for their wonderful advice. I think this is going to help a lot of researchers to be or people earlier in their research careers. Um, I'm hoping that in the notes we can get perhaps your contact information. So if people are interested in finding out some more from you, um, perhaps I could correspond with you. That would be amazing. Um, and thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Gita. Thank you. you did a, a fantastic job moderating. Our oh, I appreciate that. Thank appreciate you so you. much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, this was a lot of fun.